Hello, everyone, and welcome to the lecture on one of Russia's most beloved comedy writers, Mikhail Mikhailovich Zoshenka. Zoshenka was born in St. Petersburg in 1894, and his father was an artist of Ukrainian descent, which you can tell from his name. Uh, remember that names ending in Enka are normally Ukrainian, so Zoshenka is a Ukrainian name. But Zoshenka himself was born in St. Petersburg and spent most of his life in St. Petersburg. His mother uh, was from the minor Russian nobility, and she was a writer and an actress. So she was the one who brought writing to his attention and kind of got him started on his writing career and thinking about himself as a writer. Zoshenka went to high school in St. Petersburg, and he started law school in St. Petersburg, and there's uh, his student ID from 1913, from when he started law school, uh, there in the slide on the left. Uh, but he was unable to finish his degree due to financial pressures. So while he was from comparatively high society, or at least intelligentsia, he was from the intelligentsia, and his mother, as I mentioned, was from the nobility, uh, but of rather minor nobility. Uh, he was not rich. He did not grow up in the lap of luxury or uh, considerable prestige. He was educated and was of the educated class of society, but he was not rich and was never rich throughout his life. When World War I broke out in 1914, Zoshinka joined the military and he became a junior officer uh, and he served with considerable distinction uh, during World War I, uh, received a number of medals for bravery, and he was also wounded several times, including being the recipient of a poison gas attack that left him with permanent health problems, including permanent heart damage. Nonetheless, he later served in the Red Army during the Civil War, even though he could have gotten out of it because of his health problems, he still served for several months. And this is important to know, not so much because he wrote about it, but because of his later treatment by the Soviet regime and his relationship with the Soviet regime, that he was a decorated officer with a record of distinguished service, um, and he kept falling afoul of the Soviet regime later in life and being criticized for lack of patriotism. After the end of the Civil War, Zoshinka began writing and publishing in the early 1920s. His first story was published in 1922. And although he had been committed to uh, Russia and the Russian Empire and then later the Bolshevik cause, he nonetheless was a kind of a free spirit as an artist. And he joined the Serapian Brotherhood, a picture of which you can see there on the right, which were a group that championed artistic freedom. They believed that art should be separate from politics and that artists should practice art for the sake of art rather than practicing political art or propaganda. And as part of this group, Zoshinka wrote comic short stories. He, he started writing short stories and he quickly found his voice as a writer of comic short stories and satire. Uh, and his stories often featured uneducated narrators and the use of skas. And if you remember, I believe we spoke about it earlier, but if you remember, skas is when you write using the vernacular or using colloquial speech in written speech. Uh, and it can be both in the form of dialogue, but also when the actual narration is done in this colloquial or vernacular speech. It's written speech that sounds like low style spoken speech. And it's a particular feature of Russian writing, although certainly English language writers like Mark Twain used it as well. And the name skas uh, obviously comes from Russian skazats or skaska from this concept of saying or telling. And so Zoshinka was one of the prime examples of the use of skas in Russian literature. Immediately after the outbreak of World War II, Zoshinka volunteered for the front as an officer with battle experience, uh, but was rejected for health reasons. Uh, of course, he was already in his 40s at the time and had been dealing with the health problems caused by the poison gas attack all his life. So he was rejected as unfit for military service. And so instead, he joined a fire brigade um, and worked briefly um, patrolling the roofs of St. Petersburg or Leningrad um, during bombardments 
uh, in this volunteer fire brigade before being evacuated to Alma-Ato. And during the war, he, like Anna Akhmatova, did a considerable amount of literary work that was aimed at encouraging the populace and um, keeping up the spirits of the Soviet populace. Uh, he wrote a number of anti-fascist stories and plays and short essays. Uh, he wrote some satirical or comic plays that were performed during the war as part of the effort to help keep up people's spirits. And immediately after the war, he was awarded with another medal for service to the Soviet Union during the Great Patriotic War. The following year, however, in 1946, Zoshinka, along with Akhmatova, was singled out for harsh official criticism, and they were both in the same article um, harshly criticized and called anti-Soviet and unpatriotic. Zoshinka was excluded from the Writers' Union. He had been a member of the Writers' Union all along and had been publishing under their auspices. And even though in the 30s he had come under some pressure to tow the official line, he had managed to come close enough to the official line in his satirical pieces to be allowed to publish. However, in 1946, he was excluded from the Writers' Union and banned from publishing. In 1953, he was briefly allowed back into the Writers' Union following the death of Stalin. Uh, however, he refused to recant and repent and said instead that he considered the Writers' Union and the Soviet regime to be wrong for excluding him and banning him because of his long history of distinguished military service and literary service. And he basically refused to say that he had done anything wrong and refused to admit to any unpatriotic behavior, uh, which led to another round of bans and boycotts. And so he lived the remaining 12 years of his life in basically poverty. Uh, he was not allowed to publish his own works. He could only publish translations, uh, which he did do. And he also worked as a bootmaker, which is something he had learned uh, in his youth. And so he managed to support himself sort of as a translator and bootmaker until dying in 1958 from heart failure, but it may have been complications resulting from the poison gas attack because it caused long-term heart damage. And so um, his life was somewhat less tragic than, for example, Babel or Mandelstam's and that he was not actually executed, uh, but he was subjected to harsh official scrutiny and criticism, and he was boycotted and banned and not allowed to publish and kept in pretty dire poverty in the last years of his life. Like Akhmatova, Zoshinka experienced a fair amount of literary popularity during his life, which may have been one of the reasons why, on the one hand, the regime cracked down on him so harshly, but on the other hand, they did not actually arrest and kill him. Uh, that he was dangerously popular, he had a dangerous level of influence over the minds of ordinary Soviet citizens, but on the other hand, arresting and killing him would have caused such an outcry that it may have been decided it was just not worth it. Um, and it was better just to suppress him and um, silence him that way. And Zoshinka continues to be very popular today. He is still widely read. Many Russians know a number of his stories more or less by heart and will start telling you about their favorite um, story. A popular one is the one about the banya and the little paper numbers and how do you hold your little paper coat check number when you're naked in the banya, uh, which is a masterpiece of humor. And like I said, he's one of the most uh, popular and beloved comic or satirical writers of the 20th century. And his stories were very much about ordinary day-to-day -day Soviet life, and they managed to satirize it while at the same time being just patriotic enough to be publishable. And so he, most of his career, he was able to walk that fine line very well. He often focused on the minutia of Soviet life and uh, individual foibles and uh, the ridiculousness of individual behavior. Uh, in a way that people found very recognizable, 
and it enabled them to laugh at their current condition, while at the same time suggesting that things were going to get better and that the Soviet Union was overall on the right path. Uh, he also wrote in a very simple, compressed style, this very kind of laconic uh, style with very short sentences, and he normally had working class narrators. And this was something that appealed to the newly literate proletariat. If you recall, uh, one of the things that happened in the 20s and 30s was this explosion of literacy as the Soviet Union made a commitment to bring literacy to the masses, and they did so with extreme success, such that Russia and the Soviet Union went from a society that was minority literate to a society that had almost 100% literacy in the space of a generation or two. And as part of this, authors were called upon to write in a very simple, accessible style. Uh, I can't help but think of the call on modern American authors to write in eighth grade um, style, or better yet, I've heard fourth grade style, uh, so that you can get the maximum number of readers. Uh, Soviet writers of the time were also called upon to write in a very simple and accessible style, so that these people who were just learning how to read could uh, read their works. And Zushinko managed to do so in a way that was accessible to the newly literate populace, but was nonetheless sophisticated and clever and expressive and uh, managed to appeal to a broad swath of the reading populace uh, so that educated members of the intelligentsia also really appreciate uh, his humor and his uh, sophistication and... Um, the clever construction of his stories. And so Zoshinka is one of these writers that we may not read him a huge amount in the West, but he is still widely read and loved in Russia today. And uh, most Russians will know Zoshinka and will have a favorite Zoshinka story. And it's something that you can use to show your knowledge of Russian culture and to uh, bond with Russians if you happen to be in a situation where you need to talk about shared cultural tastes or shared cultural interests. <laughs> 